tonight for our aviation medicine event. Um, Dr. Philip Bolton has kindly uh, donated his time to talk to us about not just that, but also his time in the uh, working with the Commonwealth and Olympic Games, and also uh, just about volunteerism in general in medicine. Uh, he spent quite a bit of time in India, and so he's going to kind of give us uh, some stories from uh, those experiences. So please uh, warmly welcome Dr. Bolton. Um, thanks very much. Um, I'm not really a, a public speaker, so you, you have to forgive me. Um, I wasn't given a clear outline of what you'd want to hear about, but I've, um, for the last 20 years of my professional life, I've had um, something of uh, um, a feeling of obligation to give back, and not just in the clinic where I work. Um, so I. I've sort of had it as part of my yearly thing that I that I volunteer as often as I can and usually on a yearly basis do something. To just give you a little bit of background, I'm in my early 60s, I graduated medicine when I was 22, which is ridiculous and I look at all of you and envy you that you have a bit more maturity and a bit more understanding about what the world's all about before you actually approach the medical course. Uh, my professional history, after I worked at the Alfred for a couple of years, I went overseas and worked, travelled um, for a few more years and came back. And in the early 80s, I started the first seven day a week, um, open till midnight sort of practice in Paran, in High Street Paran, and worked about a 90 hour week for four or five years and burnt myself out completely. And I sold it and then went and sort of uh, opened another practice in North Fitzroy where I, I worked for. Uh, about 20 years, and that was just a general practice. Um, there were four doctors in it within a few years, and uh, we had physios and receptionists and nurses, and it was doing very, very well, but it got to the point where I was spending a fair bit of time actually in the administration of the practice, and that was driving me mad because I just wanted to be a doctor. I didn't want to be an administrator. So I ended up putting my hand up to be sold out or bought out, and I'm now working um, in a corporate type practice um, in Brunswick and I'm quite liking it. I've been there for nearly 10 years. Um, something happened to me personally in the mid-90s. I got sick. I got sick suddenly. I didn't expect to get sick and um, you have sort of, you know, you're lying in primary care and you're thinking, you know, what, what am I doing with my life? And I had a bit of an epiphany. I said, well, I'm doing fine with my life, but I could be doing more. And at that point, I thought, well, you know, when I get out of hospital, I'm just going to ring up and start volunteering every year. And I did. I, I rang RFDS. Um, and I rang up RFDS and I said to them, I'm a GP, I'm an inner suburban GP. I don't have very many sort of um, skills in terms of um, trauma or anything like that, but I'd really like to come up and observe. Um, see what you do, and I'd just finished an aviation medicine course, so I'd sort of segued in with volunteering, a bit of aviation, whatever. And they said, that's terrific, can we call you back in a couple of days? They didn't really believe that I was volunteering for RFDS, and particularly, you know, volunteering, I said I'd be supernumerary. They rang me back in a couple of days, and they said, well, look, we've got doctors up here in Derby, in northwestern uh, Western Australia. Uh, and they hadn't had a day off for about three years. Will you come up and spend a few weeks and just sort of be an RFDS doctor? I said, well, you know, I'm going to need bicycle clips on my pants. And they said, no, don't worry. Um, you know, there'll be other doctors there, but you'll be able to help out. So within a few weeks, I went up and had uh, registered and whatever, because you didn't have pan-Australian registration in those days, so you had to register and sort of get insurance and whatever. And I, um, I went up to Derby, and you fly into Broome, which is a really nice resort, and you get into a car and you drive 250 kilometres north, and you get to Derby, which is a really crappy town. It really has very, very little to redeem it. Um, and it was midwinter, it was August, and it was 28 degrees every day, so that most of the people who lived in and around Derby were walking around with blankets over their shoulders and they drained the hospital pool because it was much too cold to swim, it was only 28. I just couldn't believe what I walked into. <laughs> um, so the, the duties, what, what you had to do, well, you had to work in the Derby Hospital. I mean, that was a, a well set up hospital, it was a regional sort of hospital. 
there's not much region there, but it's a regional hospital. And you, so you worked in emergency, which is stuff that I hadn't done in 10 or 15 years, and you worked in the wards, which was fantastic, and you're looking after people. And you also, every few days, would be carrying the beeper for RFDS, meaning that if anything desperate happened 800 kilometres away, they'd be ringing you and they'd be asking you what to do. And so that sort of thing can happen like at a, at, with a ship in the middle of the Indian Ocean, but it can also happen on a cattle station halfway to the, to the Pilbara. It can happen uh, in an Aboriginal settlement. It can happen in a farmhouse. So that, you know, for example, you, you'd be called at three in the morning and someone would say, well, the baby's fallen in the campfire. What will we do? And um, you'd have to give them advice, and it wasn't it wasn't funny. It was real stuff. You'd have to sort of say, you know, get the baby out of the campfire. Um, you, you'd um, you'd also be be called, as I said, by ships who were in the area, um, and you'd need to be able to respond. In most of the situations uh, in Aboriginal settlements on ships and at larger cattle stations. They would have a pack, and in that pack it was like a suitcase that would open up like an old-fashioned doctor's bag, and they would have a massive array of medications, and at least some of them know how to give an injection. And so all the medications were labelled with the contents as well as a number, so that if they couldn't read words, they could be told, take number five and draw up one mil of number five and stick it in the person's backside. Um, it was really, really scary. It, 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 was, it stretched me enormously, um, but it was great fun. Um, the food was awful. Um, the demographic of the patients, um, the patients were, there were local people, there were people that worked on farms, there were, like, it was a little bit like the Wild West, you know, there were guys that sort of worked as um, um, uh, jackaroos and that sort of thing. Um, there were, a huge number of Aboriginals in the area, so there was a very large component of Aboriginals, but there were also a lot of grey nomads, people that were that had retired and they'd got into a, a an old four-wheel drive and and, um, and a little wagon behind and they were driving around Australia. So you get grey nomads coming in and they'd have what grey nomads have, they'd have heart attacks and strokes and whatever. Or they'd leave their medication at, you know behind at the last town or something like that. You'd have a lot of Aboriginal health um, and you'd have um, local health. And the Aboriginal health was interesting. Um, it, was, uh, it was a surprise to me that an Aboriginal elder at that time, and this is probably about 17, 18 years ago, an Aboriginal elder was anyone over the age of 40 um, because their life expectancy was not good. Um, the children almost universally had scabies and a lot of that scabies was infected and because they got skin infections, um, the outer skin would become infected but it would often lead to kidney damage. So that there, were, there were things that you just don't see in, suburban, in a suburban Melbourne. Um, so with each, of the, with each of the volunteering things that I'm going to talk about, I'll talk about three main ones um, and this is obviously the first. But with each of them, I'm going to give you some clinical vignettes because I, I, I think that illustrates to some degree um, the beauty of, of what you're doing and, and the sorts of differences and the sorts of, you know, mindset. Um, and please interrupt me with questions any time. And if you don't, I've got some questions prepared that I'll just hand out to you. <laughs> um, so a couple of clinical vignettes. So um, there was a lovely Aboriginal man, a full blood Aboriginal who came in and he was diabetic and he had uh, nephropathy, he had kidney damage and he came in because he had an infection in his kidneys, he had pyelonephritis. So that we had to admit him to the ward and I put a catheter in him and a drip and um, we started giving him antibiotics and he started to come good. And it was, I think, a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Anyway, Thursday, I'm doing a ward round and he's disappeared. He's gone AWOL from the ward. And he really wasn't fit to go AWOL from the ward. And I had no idea what had happened to him. And I said to the nurses, you know, where's Mr... And they said, I don't know, he's just dashed out. Anyway, um, towards the end of the day, some many hours later, um, he, he struggled back into the ward. 
and he struggled back into the ward and I said, you know, where have you been? And he says, well, you know, it's pension day. I had to go and collect my pension. I didn't want to miss it. Um, these were the days where you actually went to the bank to collect your pension. And he didn't want to miss it. Um, and I said, well, how did you cope? And he said, well, the thing in my arm I pulled out. But the thing that was in my old fella, I cut the end off and stuck it in my boot. I said, how did you, how did you get on? He says, well, I don't know. I just don't understand, Doc, but my boot keeps filling up with piss. Um, that, was, that was basic. That, that was, and that was very real. And he wasn't being funny. He just couldn't, couldn't grasp it. There was, um, there was one day that I was called out to a, an Aboriginal settlement at a place called One Arm Point. One Arm Point, I don't know whether any of you are familiar with Western Australia, one Arm Point Mill is also called Lombardina. It's a, it's a spit of land that comes out. It's not very far from, from Broome, maybe 150k from Broome. And I was called there and they said that um, a 15 year old kid had sustained burns to a significant part of his body and we'd need to go and pick him up and take him back to the hospital. Um, so we got into a, a plane which is a, a Queen Air Queen Air is a twin engine plane. It seats probably about six or eight passengers, but you have a pilot, a doctor, a nurse, and a patient. So that you've cleared the, the seats out, and you've got a um, you've got a, um, a, a a gurney of sorts. It's it's a mobile sort of thing that you can fix, and you can put up groups in it. And it's a very very well set up plane. And it's very smooth. Um, we got to one arm point and. We picked up this kid and, and he, he had burns to about 20% of his body, significant burns. And they were all in the front here. And I said, you know, sort of, what happened? You know, how did you burn yourself? Thinking that he'd had some accident cooking or whatever. And, and he said his bomb had exploded. So that there's, there's various things that you just don't quite expect when you go. Um, Apart from the duties in the hospital and going out and collecting patients in the in the plane, uh, we were also responsible for some work in Aboriginal settlements. And uh, the work in the Aboriginal settlements um, basically was going down. There were, often there was a nurse there semi permanently, and one day they they told me to um, to go and, um, and and sort of do a clinic there, see if there's anyone unwell. Um, these places uh, and you know quite remote the, this Aboriginal settlement was on the Fitzroy River um, and it was about 200 K um, on a corrugated road and there was no fixed road um, the the medicine in these places is largely um, medicine which is similar to what you see in the hospital there but it's isolated so that you have a high incidence of diabetes, you have a high incidence of heart disease, stroke and that sort of thing. Uh, essentially, the, um, there, there is not a lot of fresh vegetables and not a lot of fresh fruit. If you open the fridges in these places, they're full of Coca-Cola and pies. Um, and it's, it, it's very, very sad. Um, I, uh, I'll go on and start talking about the Olympics, but um, does anyone want to ask me anything about our FDS experience? You go ahead. Um, just with, um, I just didn't realise that you would get caught up and get to uh, give advice to people out on like farms and things like that. Absolutely. Is that, do they call just triple zero or? No, they call, they call RFDS first. Uh, yeah, because there's no triple zero out there. It, I mean, maybe you filled it through, I don't know what number they call, but they, but you are the triple zero, essentially. Okay. There are, there are ambulances that are attached to the hospital, and there are planes. They've got two or three planes. They've got a pilots on rotation, so they're on call. And you can be called out any time. So when they call you and you give advice, is that saying that like you would give advice and not go out to that site? You or might, that it depends. If you're in between, you get there. Yeah, so it depends on the clinical situation. You might give advice and say, look, I'll be there in an hour and a half. Yep. It might be 400 k away. Yep. Um, so you might give advice, or you might say, you know, it's not acute, bring the patient in, or we'll meet you at a certain point halfway between. It just really depends on the clinical situation. Sure. Um, a lot of what RFDS DS does is, um, is retrieval rather than managing. In other words, they're taking patients around, you know, 
um, picking people up. But the, if you're interested in the planes at all, the planes are quite extraordinary. They, the, these are planes that can land and take off on about 100 metres. So they're, they're really, they're ideally suited for that sort of thing. They can sort of land on your three nature strips in, in Melbourne suburbs would be enough for this thing to land. It just comes to an abrupt sort of halt. And, uh, and always the pilot has a little bell, an old fashioned bell on a wooden handle because almost everywhere he, he, he's gonna land, he has to swoop down and ring the bell so that the kids get off and the, and the sheep and whatever get off whatever he wants to land. So, so he clangs the bell and then he does a loop around and then comes and lands, which you know, really does a lot for your stomach if you need it. Okay, so the Olympics, the 2000 Olympics. Um, uh, I was asked to, uh, to work at the 2000 Olympics. I, I have no idea why. Um, I was asked about two years before the Olympics. Um, and it took about two years to clear me because um, you need to have ASIO clearance. It's not just police. It's not just working with children. You, 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 you know, it's pretty heavy stuff. ASIO come in, they, you know, look at your uh, fingerprints and look at your entrails and whatever. And they really, they really want to know um, the ins and outs of where you've been and who you are. And so it was an interesting experience just from the point of view of being cleared by ASIO. Um, the training consisted basically of going up to Sydney on three or four occasions and uh, getting a bit of a, a, a feel for the layout of the place. Um, and there wasn't a specific preparation, but you sort of knew uh, essentially what you were going to be doing. Um, in the Olympic Village, there, the Olympic Village is a closed village. You can't just walk in, obviously, if, for security reasons. But within the Olympic Village, there's, there's a thing called a polyclinic. And the polyclinic, is um, quite an extraordinary structure. It, it is basically the most advanced medical um, clinic that you could possibly have at that point of time. So that MRIs had just come in, there was an MRI there. Whatever you need was there. The polyclinic was divided for medical purposes into three sections. There was an emergency department, similar to an A&E here, except my, you know, a microcosm of it. Um, there was a sports medicine department, as you'd, you'd imagine, and there was a general medicine clinic. Um, the, the important thing about the polyclinic was that that wasn't all. There was also radiology, 24 hours a day. You could get an MRI at about two minutes notice. You could get a CT scan at about one minutes notice. Whatever you wanted was there. You had banks of physios, you had banks of podiatrists, you had banks of you had opt opt optoms, you had just about anything you could possibly want was available at the flick of a switch, at the picking up of a phone, at the click of your fingers. It was extraordinary. Um, so what do you do at an Olympic game? So the, the, the demographic of who needs help is divided between competitors and spectators. And the spectators obviously outnumber the competitors. Um, there are huge numbers, tens of thousands of them swarming in every day and there, is a, um, there, is a, there are medical facilities at every event um, which is set up so that a doctor or a nurse or someone can look after the spectators. As far as the competitors go, um, if you come from a very rich country, if you come from one of, you know, sort of um, first world country, if you're, if you're Usain Bolt or someone like that, then you're going to work, you're going to actually arrive at the Olympics with your own doctor, your own podiatrist, your own physio, your own masseur, you're, you're going to have a team because that's how you get to get a gold medal. 99% of the competitors that come to the Olympics, they know they're not going to get a medal. And they're there to have a good time, to party, or they're there because they need a few things fixed up in their life, or they're there because their uncle is the president of the country, or they're there for a whole lot of reasons, but they're not necessarily there to win a medal. What we see on television is like the thin edge. It really is the thin edge. You have huge numbers of competitors that come along um, because but, you know, they want to win, but they know they're not going to. Um, in, the, uh, the, in the demographic of the people that come to the polyclinic, there are also the officials, and the officials that go with every team usually outnumber 
the, the competitors. The officials are people who, like the, like the chef de Michon, but, but much, much, much more. And so very often from second and third world countries, the official will be someone who someone owes a favour to. So, for example, if you come from some North African country that I won't name, uh, and you're just retired as a two-star general, they'll say, you know, would you like to go to Sydney and have a good time? And the first thing we'll do is have a good time and have an infarct the next day. So, you know, so <laughs> they're, they're, that's the sort of thing that we were dealing with. We weren't just dealing with, with competitors. And there were also there are other people there. There are media people and other workers. Um, the... You know, the interesting things about it were, were that um, it, it wasn't what you expected. I, I worked in the general medical section. I also worked in the emergency section. We saw quite a number of, of you know, acute heart attacks and things like that, which was fine. But the commonest illness that we saw, and I'm sure you'd understand this, the commonest illness that we saw were STIs, um, because this is young, healthy people who have come to party. And uh, so we saw STIs in, in abundance. In fact, the, the, the polyclinic had a huge urn, like a, a big, big urn, and it was full of condoms. And because it was Australia, we had passion fruit and strawberry flavoured condoms. <laughs> and, and people would take handfuls as they came through. And even if they weren't sick, they'd come into the polyclinic and take handfuls. Um, there was it was said, and I'm not sure if this is apocryphal or true, but it was said that there, were, there was a complaint from some athletes from another country and then they had to bring in banana flavour. <laughs> um, so we lived, in the, we lived in the polyclinic. We actually slept in. I slept in for you know, four or five nights. I was, I was there for two weeks and I didn't always sleep in the place, but sometimes you just had to. And... Apart from the duties, as I said, in the emergency and in the, and in the general medical section of the polyclinic, I would also go out to um, I would also go out to to some of the events. And uh, in the events, like um, occasionally, I was on for the athletes, which meant that I would be in the change room or whatever. Um, and occasionally, I was on for the um, for the spectators. I was on for the spectators. Um, for a final in, um, in baseball between America and Japan. There, were, there was a lot of people who collapsed. They got so excited about a home run. I didn't understand it. Um, but, uh, but we also, like, you know, you'd go into the change rooms and, like, the, the American team had a, had a as, you'd, as you'd expect, they had all their own doctors and they would, like, these, these guys would get off the bus and they, were, they couldn't move any fingers, all their fingers had been broken and the doctors would be injecting steroids into each joint before they went out there. Suddenly they could move and they were subtle and they could get out there and play a game. It was very, very interesting. Um, some, some sample sort of um, clinical vignettes. Um, I guess clinical vignettes... Look, it was said, and again, this is the problem. It was said that there was one African team that turned up and that the first thing that all the athletes did was come and have HIV testing because there wasn't a decent HIV testing lab in their country and they, they all arrived and there was a high rate of HIV in their country. I'm not talking about their team. You know, that people would come in and just be tested. There were people that came in from countries where they hadn't been able to access a dentist we had a bank of dentists working all day just looking after these people. There was a guy from one of the stands, um, I won't say which stand, but one of the stands who came along to see me. He'd had, he, he, was a, um, he was a guy who looked after the horses for equestrian in their country. He'd been kicked by a horse six weeks earlier. He had a massive infected sore pre-tibial just on his shin. And, you know, it was, it was really, really sad, but... All he, all he needed was some decent dressings and some Kephlosporins or some, you know, some first, second, third generation antibiotic. It really didn't matter because he, he was totally antibiotic naive. And over a period of 10 days, this thing that he'd had for six weeks, oh, sorry, six months, just, just totally cleared up. So you can imagine, we're not talking um, uh, sort of 
remote or sort of, you know, unusual stuff, but we're talking about people who didn't necessarily have the opportunity to access reasonable medical care or allied health care. And they came along to the Olympics and the first thing they did was come in. Go ahead. Did you, did you come across any doping while you were at the um, Olympic Village? Doping was handled by, is it the Wanda or something? I don't know. Yep. Yeah, we, were, we didn't come across doping per se, but, but one of our preparatory um, sessions was all about doping and about what medications you could give and what not to give. Um, and that was really interesting. And so, you know, you have people who are asthmatics, can you give them Brickenell, can you give them Ventil and all this sort of thing? And, you know, someone comes in with a snotty nose, do you give them Sudafed? You know, so, yeah. Um, so that was interesting and it was part of the prep and I've forgotten because it really is irrelevant in general practice 16 years later, but it was interesting from that perspective. Let me say that um, I also was asked to work at the Commonwealth Games here in 2006 and I, I won't <coughs> go into that in detail, but just to make one point about it, and the, the, at the Olympics, if you had the best pair of track shoes, if you had the best pair of runners in the world, you would use them and then you would put them in a locker and you would lock the locker and leave them off. At the Commonwealth Games, which in some ways were simil similar, in, in many ways weren't similar, if you had the best pair of track shoes in, 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 at the Commonwealth Games and you was like an Australian and there was a Gambian guy who was going to run the next day, you'd give it to him. So it was really, really interesting. There was much more of a family atmosphere at the Commonwealth Games. And it was competitive, but not competitive in the same way. It was not competitive like you'd be competing with your cousin or something like that. So it was very, very nice. OK, so on the second last day at the Olympics, um, a woman came up to me, and I don't know where she came from, and she was like, I don't know, maybe from some agency. I have no idea. And she looked at, I had an infinity, um, uh, accreditation, so I could go anywhere. I could step into a bathroom, male, female, I, I don't do that, but <laughs> you know, anything like that, um, and, and just ask someone to pee in a pot for that reason. So I had the affinity. Anyway, she came up to me, she said, um, Are you a volunteer? You know, I said, Yes. And she said, Do you like volunteering? I said, I'm having a lot of fun at the Olympics. And she said, Well, um, would you go overseas for, a, for an Australian team? And I said, well, you know, what sort of team? But it's basically an I team. Would, would you go overseas? And I said, yeah, I guess so. And Can she said, do you mind if I take five minutes if anyone wishes to borrow? Thank you. It's the library closing. Oh, okay. So she said, well, um, can, can I just take your name down? I said, sure. And that was it. Nothing, you know, nothing more than that conversation. And I thought, mm, that was strange, and I forgot about it. And three weeks later, I get a call from a guy called Paul Smith in Western Australia. And it's a little bit like the Blues Brothers, you know. We're putting we're putting a group together, and, and we'd, like, <laughs> we'd like you to come. We're going to go to India. We're going to do an eye camp there. And I said, "What's an eye camp?" He says, "Well, basically, we've got optoms and we've got um, optical dispensers, and we've been collecting glasses. We've got you know twenty thousand pairs of glasses, and we've gone to the prisons in Western Australia. We've got all the prisoners working on straightening out the lenses and straightening out the whatever the earpieces." And we've got them all codified so that we know that they're plus ones and plus sixes or whatever, the, however they do that. Um, and so we've got these suitcases full of glasses and we're going to go and we're going to actually, we're going to refract thousands of people and we're going to give them glasses and look after them. I said, well, that sounds interesting. Do you need a doctor? And he says, well, we've done this once or twice before and we like to have a doctor. We don't like to have a doctor to look after the team. We also like to have a doctor in case um, someone needs to have their cataracts done and we get them in and we just want to know that they're not actively sick, that they're not sort of, you know, fulminating TB or something like that. I said, fine, I'm in. So I went and that was the first of six or seven aid missions that I've done in India with this group called Equal Health. Um, so, so far, is this all right? Do you want to hear about this? Okay, no, all right. Um, so, so Equal Health was started in about 1996, a few years earlier, and basically what they did was, as I intimated, they, they do eye camps and they, they go to places in rural, remote India. Uh, they also do camps in Suwajo in South Africa, and they've also done camps in East Timor. 
Um, so the mission goes for a couple of weeks and, and basically you go to Singapore um, the day before the mission, you have a last reasonable shower and, um, and then you, you fly into Chennai um, and you stay uh, in, well there are various places that I've stayed but um, most of them have been in orphanages. So you go to an orphanage maybe 100k south of Chennai and it's, it's a little bit remote, it, I don't know whether it's rural or not, there's a lot of people everywhere so it's hard to tell. Um, and based in an orphanage, the first thing you do is you care for your, um, you care for your, for your fellow travellers, the Australians on the group, and you're responsible for their care. You also care for the kids, and you check them out, you examine them, you, you look after them. This orphanage um, had about 800 kids, most of them, uh, most of them under the age of 12. Many of them. Uh, were not orphans as we understand orphans to be. In other words, they had parents, but their parents couldn't cope with them because they were the seventh or the eighth or the ninth child. So they were taken to the orphanage. Uh, the orphanage was run by a church group of some sort, but I was never really clear about who. Um, and uh, essentially, um, we would do preventative health checks. We would look, look and see. Um, it was very, very common for the kids to have infected scabies, um, infected bites. It was very common for them to have a bit of anosis A, um, so a lack of vitamin A. I don't know whether you guys have seen that sort of thing. You don't see it in Australia much, except in Aboriginal communities. Um, and uh, basically it affects their skin. Um, you, the eye checks that we did, we would, we would go out of the orphanage um, we would go out of the orphanage, usually on a daily basis, so we would look after the kids and we'd treat their scabies and whatever, but we'd also go and do little camps in various places. We'd set up, we'd, we'd set up a tent or something like that. Absolutely nowhere, like in the middle of nowhere, you'd just set up a tent and somehow by sort of, you know, and, and you hadn't announced that you were going to go there, or you'd be in a little village and you hadn't announced you were going to go there, you, the people who were organising us understood that we, where we would go, but we didn't know where we were going, and the people who, where we arrived didn't know we were going to come. So, uh, and you just set up, you'd set up an eye, eye camp, so you'd have a whole lot of different stalls, and you'd have a doctor, and you'd have a couple of nurses, you might have a dentist, you'd have a couple of optical dispensers, and you would run through and see whether you could refract or, or, or look after as many patients as you could. It usually went very, very well. Um, once there was a riot, um, you, you, you'd set up and um, within maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, there'd be four or 500 people waiting to see you. So it wasn't an easy task. And you'd be there for, say, maybe eight, 10 hours. And not all the people would see all, all those that are available. Um, you occasionally would just refract, but occasionally if people were AFAX, if they couldn't see anything and they had cataracts, you'd arrange for them to have their cataracts done. And in later years, we used to go back with a couple of eye surgeons who would have special permission. We would set up a surgical um, team in Trivandrum, in Trichy, sorry, not Trivandrum, Trichy. We also set up a surgical team south of Chennai and over a period of six or seven years, um, we refracted and gave vision back to over 100,000 people, um, which is pretty remarkable. And we did over 10,000 cataract operations, which is also pretty remarkable. Um, the, the sorts of, I mean, where we stayed, if, if you're interested to know, like it was really, um, it was a little bit, uh, it wasn't pleasant. Um, you, you'd be sleeping on a concrete floor, and you, rodents would, would, would crawl over you in the night, but, but the, that didn't creep me out much. What really creeped me out was in the, in the orphanage, they had a position of snake catcher. So that in, and, and once you say snake catcher to me, I'm, I'm not that keen. And, um, <laughs> and so this snake catcher, in one week that we were based at the orphanage, caught 17 cobras. The cobras had sort of come out of the ground um, and you'd have to be very careful where you put your feet. And if you've got sort of a dicky prostate and you have to go out and pee at night and it's dark and you know there are cobras there, it's very, very, very unfortunate. Okay, um, 
what you did was you'd have local interpreters with you, um, and and that was they were usually very very good, um, but. You need to have some connection to someone local um, or some op local organisation. You can't just turn up in a country that needs help and at the airport just put your hand up to the customs guy and say, well, where do I go? So you need sort of someone who's connecting you to the locals and um, generally speaking, it works well. Um, there, there were occasional problems because um, you'd say to a patient, you know, come back tomorrow for a dressing and the interpreter would speak for you know 10 minutes and you know that the interpreter wasn't saying come back tomorrow for addressing. It took us quite a while, um, but um, at one stage, and I don't know whether it was the second or third camp, someone worked out that what they were, patients were being told was, if you get better, you've got to come to church on Sunday. And we didn't really like that. That wasn't really why we were there. Not that I've got anything against going to church on Sunday, but it's not what we were. And it was a very, very difficult thing to get around the fact that people were, the, the interpreters had their own agenda. One of the camps I did was in northern Bengal. You, we flew into Calcutta, and then we went north of Calcutta four or five hours to a little town called Katwa, and then and Katwa is on the railway, it's also on the Ganges. When we, um, when we arrived in Katwa, we went about, I don't know, half an hour um, to, the, to the east of Katwa and arrived at a psychiatric hospital called Na Ananda Nikitan. Ananda Nikitan is a psychiatric hospital um, which is, uh, um, is a very interesting place and it was quite an experience to be in a, to sort of living in a, in a psychiatric hospital in rural Bengal. Um, it's a psych hospital unlike what we imagine a psych hospital to be here. Uh, generally speaking, people don't leave. They, they go there and, and that's it. They don't leave. Um, the, the, the place haven't had a doctor. When we arrived, the place haven't had a doctor visit for um, six months or so and one of the reasons that our group was called was because a lot of the patients needed care. There were, there were patients with all sorts of illnesses and, and it was very unfortunate. There were also um, patients who weren't, strictly speaking, psychiatric. Um, quite a few of the patients had got together and there were some little children there. There were some babies and little children and they were growing up in a locked ward of, of a psych hospital. Um, and, and you know, it's very, um, it's, it's a little bit traumatic to sort of experience that sort of thing, but that's the way it was. There were also children that had been sent there because their village elder had said, look, you've got to go to hospital. Um, they might have had just very sort of slight physical deformities, their ears mightn't have been even or that, whatever. For whatever reason, they'd been sent there. And they'd been sent, there was a children's ward there. And, and, and the children were essentially um, just regular kids. Um, so to give you some, oh, oh by the way, we talk about you know, the, the, the whole issue of um, your interpreters. Um, so this was, this was Northern Bengal and we had, we had warned them, we said, we, you know, we, we don't want you to tell people that they've got to go to church on Sunday if they feel better. Um, so what happened was that we worked there for a week or two and towards the end, we finally got some, one of the interpreters to, uh, to sort of explain to us what he was telling the patients and, and he promised us that he wasn't telling them that they had to go to church on Sunday, he was telling them that they had to vote communist um, in the next election <laughs> if they got better. If they didn't get better, they could vote whoever they want. So, you know. so um, it's, it, there, there, are, there are subtexts in all of these things and it was, it, it was very interesting. Um, to give you some examples of the sort of some clinical vignettes of the sorts of things that you might see in, in this place and, and how you might help um, someone. Um, and the fact that, um, well, I went there, I was the doctor, there were the other second doctor was a paediatric reg from the children's here, lovely fellow, worked with me for a few weeks. And this was just post tsunami. And so there was a lot of sort of, um, there was a lot of disturbance amongst the patients about what had happened in the tsunami. But um, some of the sorts of things, um, when we arrived, there was a 12 year old child who had polio 
when he was about three, and um, and he had no function below the waist. He was uh, he was essentially paraplegic, and he he was um, he was getting around the world on his front, um, going like this with his elbows. He had massive calluses on his elbows, and. We had a, an OT student in the group, and we, we said to her, you know, this is terrible, can we, can we make him a wheelchair? And she, she basically said, look, a wheelchair is very complex. We can buy one if we all chip in, but it'll take weeks and weeks to come up from Calcutta. Why don't we just get him a, a little, we, we, can, we can get a couple of little wheels, and we can just make a little board, and he can sit on the board and use his hands to get around. We did this, it was the first time he'd been upright in, in years. And it was just simple little things that, with the sort of training that, or the, the, being able to see alternatives, you know, being able to see that you can help them in ways. Throughout, throughout all of these trips to India, there were very, very few instances in which we used medication. It's not really what we were there for. It's not, we weren't there to, I mean, we saw some terrible illness. We saw elephantiasis and we saw heaps of tuberculosis and scrofula, which is the TB of the neck. And we saw uh, leprosy um, on a number of occasions. And it was, it was um, difficult to sort of see these things and say, well, you know, that's not we're here. To, we're not really here. That's not part of our agenda. We can't cure you. But the things that we could do were practical. The things we could do were talk to them about preventative health, talk to them about keeping files on patients, talk to them about patients' rights. Um, the, the truly disturbed patients were kept in appalling conditions in the psychiatric hospital. And one of the things that we did was that we actually helped them um, write a charter of patient rights. Um, there were also, there were many, many things. I could talk for a long time about this. Um, the guy giving out the medication was a chronic schizophrenic, so, and there were very, very few um, medications. He was a pharmacist who had been sent there um, because he was very disturbed. He was paranoid, and he had choice of Lagactyl and Malaryl. He didn't have any of, any of the newer antipsychotics, and basically they cause you all sorts of problems in, in, in the way you function, and he was throwing the medication through the window of the wards. He didn't want to go into the locked wards, so he was just throwing it through. There were lots of patients, people would take whatever they want. So it was, it was very, very difficult. But things have improved enormously, and, and our group now has a relationship with this place. Um, I've done other um, voluntary stuff, um, but... Um, you been able to secure any funding uh, now for these, for these trips you take down there? No, you, you pay for yourself. Yeah. Mm. You pay for yourself. Except the student, I took a, a fifth year medical student from Melbourne Uni on one of the trips, and I think he got a grant. Okay. Yeah. But okay. he loved it. He had a great time. Yeah. I was going to ask you about um, how you approach things which you may, you know, you don't really see in Australia. So, like the vitamin A deficiency or those infectious, like the whole battery of infectious disease okay. presentations. So, look. How do, you, how do you approach something like that when, when you've never really seen it before or dealt with it much before yeah. in the Melbourne? Look, you, you, you learn as you go. Um, you, you try not to fix everything and you take little steps. Um, with the avonomosis, you're talking about diet. Um, very often it's, it's a diet that's extremely poor in, in fats. Um, so I think it's a fat soluble diet. I don't know. Anyway, the, um, but you talk to them about diet, talk to them about having green vegetables, talk to them about having a little bit of protein, go to the places where their food is being prepared and just have a look around and talk to them about hygiene, all that sort of thing. But the very, very basics can make a difference. The very basics can make a difference. And also, um, you know, people, um, yeah, pe people sort of uh, respond really well. One, I mean, apart from the eye camp business and, and looking after people's vision, people really just loved the fact that you'd come. They knew that you'd come from, these are very, very poor, very, very, um, tend to be sort of the lowest socioeconomic class in India, which is a very low socioeconomic class. They're often, these are untouchables and whatever, and they just sort of, um, you know, people appreciate the fact that you're there. People appreciate the fact that there. We, we did a, a Chennai slum clinic on one day. Um, there were little children there just walking around, three and four-year-olds, with no family, no offending for themselves. 
I don't know any three or four year old in Australia who can fend for themselves. Little four year old kids just walking around holding hands, um, picking scraps and you know eating scraps and whatever. So that you know just talking to them, maybe you know getting the nurse to clean the scabies up, showing them how to wash wounds and that sort of thing, make a huge difference. Yeah. And they love the fact that you've come. They love the fact that you're going there to try to help them, which is it makes a big difference. Um, yeah. So, uh, ask me any questions, or, or I'll just keep talking. I'm happy to keep talking. Yeah, go on. Do you reckon that um, the preventative sort of aspects of health would, in some ways, have a larger effect than, say, going in and just dealing with a few people? Well, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, look, just talking, talking to people about how to handle food. Um, Talk to people how to handle open wounds. Um, just talk to them about, you know, dental hygiene. It does make a difference, and just, just in in everyday stuff. I mean, we did not carry. There, there was, there was an instance where on one of the trips that I didn't go on, there was a doctor who was really gung ho, really really gung ho, and he got to Melbourne airport to get on the plane to go to Singapore to have the shower before you go to India. He got to the airport with a suitcase full of vials of adrenaline and morphine and all this sort of thing. They sent him home. They sent him home. They said, look, you haven't got a clue. That's not what we're here for. If you're carrying morphine, you know, you're going to go to jail in Singapore anyway. <laughs> and you should. Yeah? How do you find sort of adjusting back to life in Melbourne and, and going to the clinic day and day out. That, that's one of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is so good. I, you know, um, did, did you see the film Lost in Translation? Yeah. Okay, so you go on one of these trips and the first thing that happens is you have a totally altered reality, totally altered reality. All sorts of things happen I won't even talk about. But let me say to you that on one of the trips out of 24 people, three came home and their relationships or marriages dissolved. So it really plays with your head um, and it takes a little while. Um, there was one trip that I came home and I was deeply depressed, I remember. I was just, you know, I was just absolutely blue as um, and couldn't see past anything and had great difficulty dealing with people wanting to just have three days off for a snotty nose. Um, and that's a lot of general practice. Um, so yeah, it, it, how do you deal with it? Um, when in the India experience, um, every single day um, you debrief at the end of the day. It's a really important part of the day. It didn't happen with the Olympics. It didn't have to. It didn't happen with um, RFDS. It didn't really have to. But you had a bit of mutual support from the doctors. But in India, it is absolutely critical. Bless you. Um, absolutely critical. You you um, you know that you come to the end of the day. You might have done a twelve-hour day, and before you eat or during the eat or whatever, you you sit around and you say what went on today, and you try to offload a bit. Um, did you see something terrible? Did you see something wonderful? Did you make a difference? Um, and it sounds really superficial, and it is, but it helps. And you need to be able to talk about it at the end of every day. Um, sometimes you need to be able to talk about it um, at the end of the two weeks as well. But what I didn't say is that sort of on the very last day, which is really, um, it's really funny, you get like 25 people uh, booking in to a hotel for like four hours or something um, because you've got to clean yourself up before you come home to your family and for sure you've got scabies and pretty sure you've got worms and pretty sure you've got other stuff so you know take, take all sorts of stuff so yeah you've really got to clean so yeah you all pile into one hotel room you go to a reasonable hotel and you just go in and shower and you come out with the towel around and some friend you know slaps the, the scabie all over you <laughs> it's all right it's not so bad yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, talking about coping, and, and look, it's a similar question as to like who, who should do this and who, sh who shouldn't. Um, we had one instance where 
um, a couple of so, see most of the people that come along are just they're, they're not medical or allied health um, they're just like volunteers so they're going to be a volunteer refractor so it takes them about an hour to learn how to you know cover your eyes say is this look better or this look better and most of us have done it and it's not very difficult so that it, you don't need it really for, you know we had like a an airline stewardess we've had bank clerks we've had teachers we've all sorts of people and it's fantastic um, but on one occasion, um, and I think it was in the north at Ananda Nikitan in in, uh, in um, Bengal, two people had to go home because they just spun out. They just they sort of went catatonic. They just stopped talking and that. And there's no way. I mean, you're in a psych hospital. It's the worst place to be. <laughs> well, emotionally. So yeah, we just sort of sent them home. Yeah, yeah. Have you found, like, when you come back to Australia and you talk to your family or your friends about your experiences, do you think that that helps you to sort of integrate it? No, nah, you've got to talk to people who've been there. It's yeah. like a secret society. You, you talk to your family, they think you're bonkers, you know. <laughs> so why are you worried about these people that, you know, you never going to see again? Um, it's true, you know. You, you, you need to talk to people who, um, who've, who've been there or who've done something similar because, yeah, do you think you've encouraged people to do something similar? Absolutely. That was my pubbing message. Do, do, do we finish now? <laughs> 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 uh, so, hang on a second. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to, uh, like, I, I wanted someone to ask me about personal safety. Like, do you feel safe? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll answer that. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, I mean, the one time when there was a riot about people, there was a riot in India where people who thought they weren't going to be able to be seen and they weren't going to be able to be seen, they started to get, a, it was a riot, and we had to run for the um, for the bus, the minibus that we were getting around in. That was pretty bad. But otherwise, I never actually got sick in India. I got all sorts of skin problems, and um, and I had I probably had worms. But that's not so bad. I went to Vanuatu um, about five or six years ago and just worked for a short while. And I'm, I'm vegan, so I, I don't eat much. But I, I must have had some aberrant tomato or something. <laughs> and and uh, I came home here on a Sunday night. And Monday morning, I'd get up to go to work. And I didn't feel very good. And by about midday, I'd collapsed at work. And by Six hours later, I was in ICU, um, and I spent about a week in ICU with Shigella septicemia. And Shigella, yeah, it was, it's a it's a nasty bug, a really nasty bug, and and um, and yeah, you you don't want to experience forty bowel actions a day, and you know fever and blah blah blah. So yeah, no, that was horrible. But I have no idea how I got it. But I, you know, I didn't pick it up from a patient who was sick. Obviously, must have eaten something. So. That's my story about personal safety. Otherwise, um, I did, I mentioned to one of the guys here that I, I've, apart from this, I mean, I've done other stuff, and I did animal rescue in Rajasthan, in Udaipur, once for a few days. Uh, I took one of my daughters over there, and I just wanted her to experience something. And she was not, she was in a high school, she was in year 11, so she couldn't really come on a, on a medical aid camp. So we went and we did, um, some animal rescue. Animal rescue is run by a fellow called Jim Myers. It's called Animal Aid Unlimited or Animal Aid International Summit. And it's a little um, village outside of Udaipur where he funds a, a vet. Um, and what happens, he's got a little van, like 101 Dalmatians, he's got this little van and he drives through the streets of Udaipur and he picks up like cats and dogs and goats and that sort of thing. And he throws them in the back of the van and then he drives it out to this little village and they spay them and they treat them for hydatids because they've all got hydatid disease and they treat them for rabies or whatever they see if they're rabid anyway um, so I did that for a few days and that was probably dangerous because I realized on the second day that I didn't have rabies inoculation and we were handling animals so it was really dumb so yeah there's some personal safety issues anyway on that note are there any more questions no. Okay. So, um, so I would uh, I would encourage you all to uh, 
to do what you can with your medical degree to, to fix the world because it needs a lot of fixing. Um, to take to take opportunities when they arise, and if they don't arise, go out and make opportunities, and most important, and to enjoy to enjoy it. Thank you.